Um, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Olga Fakani. I'm a third year PhD in classics. I'm here today to talk about classical reception and enlivening text based courses. Um, my presentation will focus on ways that we can make the uh, text based courses in the humanities more accessible to students and kind of capture their interest. I will use classics, which is my area of, oh goodness, my area of research and interest as an example to talk about ways that we can enliven the text, the classical text, prompt critical thinking among students, and prompt engagement with the text, and show ways in which the classical text and uh, events in the past are actually embedded in our present lives. So before we get into the presentation, um, I want to get an idea of my audience composition. So I want to ask you a question. Um, how many of you here work with texts in their discipline? Oh, excellent, very good. Uh, which department are you from? Which text do you work with? Anthropology. Anthropology. So we work with a wide variety of texts. Wide variety, all right. Do we have anybody from history? Feminist studies, uh, Portuguese, well, of course, we saw the presentation. Um, the type of texts that I work with are very, very old. Uh, some of the texts are actually Ovid's Metamorphosis that was shown before. So others are um, Homer, Odyssey, or the Iliad, or Greek tragedies. These beautiful ancient texts that were performed in front of people in Athens on a stage, but that now we have in a textual form that is very, very hard to crack. Students feel put off because these texts are so complicated. They are in a poetic form, most of them, like the Odyssey Metamorphosis or these Greek tragedies. And students don't feel like they can teach them anything. They're old, they were written 2,000 years ago. What can we really learn from them? So what are some ways that we can capture students' interest and convey this passion that we have for what we teach? Let's get right into it. How do we enliven the text? So something that I like to do when I teach classics, and most of the classes that I teach are classes like Greek mythology, which students have to take as a requirement. So we get a lot of students from chemistry and engineering who have no idea what they're getting into, and they're not interested in this. How do we capture the interest even before we get to the text itself? I like to bring to class copies of original manuscripts, the actual Greek text for them to see. It's a different language. We're about to crack that code. I also like them to see not only just the text, how it looks like, but also to hear the ancient text. So I would occasionally read the ancient text with a poetic inflection. It sounds different. It sounds beautiful. It's like a song, a little bit like the rap that we were talking about. I also like to bring um, archaeological artifacts to class. For instance, one of the texts that we are examining in class one day mentions uh, funerary practices. Well, in that case, I like to bring to class funerary statuettes, actual archaeological artifacts that the student can touch, can see. Oh my god, these were used in funerary practices. That is kind of cool. It's not just dead stuff in the past. It is crucial at this point to locate the text that we are examining in time and kind of provide an historical cultural background that the students can use to um, navigate the text by themselves. Why don't we take an actual example from antiquity? The Agamemnon is a text from Greek mythology that I teach often. The Agamemnon is a Greek tragedy, part of a trilogy, written by Aeschylus, a Greek tragedian, and performed in Athens, in Greece, in 458 BCE, over 2,000 years ago. The Agamemnon dramatizes the return of Agamemnon, here in this painting by Jacques-Louis David in, in red. He returns home after 10 years of war. His home is in Mycenae, in Greece. And he's bringing with him all the spoils of war, right? The war lasted 10 long years, and they won, the Greeks won. And among all the spoils, there is this captive girl, Cassandra from Troy, who's a prophetess. She can see the future, but she's been cursed that nobody would believe her when she speaks the truth. So she knows what's going to happen, tries to let other people know, and nobody believes her. And Agamemnon, with the spoils, his army, Cassandra, arrives home, and waiting for him at home is his wife, the queen, Clytemnestra. 
with the, with the crown on her head in the painting. And Clytemnestra, instead of being happy to see her husband, has been plotting his murder for 10 years with the help of her lover, Aegisthus. This is real stuff that we're getting into. <laughs> He's been plotting, plotting the death of Agamemnon. Why? She should be happy to see him after 10 years of war. He made it. He survived. She's not. She's really mad at him because Agamemnon, before leaving for war, had to sacrifice their daughter, Iphigenia. He received a command from a goddess that he had to slaughter her on an altar in order for him to be able to sail to Troy and fulfill his duty as that commander. He had to bring his army to Troy. So he had to kill Iphigenia, their daughter, or figured in the painting in the middle. And Clytemnestra, for 10 years, has been developing this revenge inside of her. She hates him. And when Agamemnon returns home from Troy, she kills him while he's taking a bath with the help of her lover, who's not in the picture. This is Achilles, this is a different guy. He's, <laughs> he's OK, he's OK. And so I like to start with prompting the students' critical thinking by drawing out some of the themes in the tragedy. What is this tragedy really about? What do we see in the text? We have some pretty heavy topic that we're delving into at this point. We have betrayal, revenge, violence, all sorts of kind of like scheming. But what are these themes really about? For example, betrayal. Most students, all they can see is the betrayal of Clytemnestra, the wife, who's taken up a lover in 10 years. How dare she, right? Mm -hmm. And then kills her husband when he comes home. What about the betrayal of the husband? who kills their daughter and betrays the familial ties that he has with his wife and the daughter. How do these two different types of betrayal in the text affect our understanding of what justice is? Does it deserve to die? Can we even ask that question? Hmm. Students are a little bit hesitant when the, with regards to these texts. This is a good point to mention the fact that a lot of the texts that I deal with in classics they present us with some very sensitive topics. So I can't stress this enough. It is very important to be aware of students' reactions. We don't know what our students have been through. Some of the topics that we are engaging with are violence and uh, domestic violence, sexual abuse, homicide. So it's very important to be aware of the student's reaction and also give content warning when needed. So we draw out the themes. And how do we go to the next step? So prompt the engagement of students with the text and have the students think about, well, how does this text make me think differently about things in my own life? For instance, how do the themes that emerge from the classical text engage with our own concept of justice and honor? What is honor in the text? Was Agamemnon, the king of Mycenae, after his honor when he decided to slaughter his daughter on an altar? Was he defending his honor? How important it is to defend your duty, military duty. You know, you are a commander. What about the tension between familial ties and your, uh, uh, your job? You know, you're a commander. This is what you have to do. How does this affect our understanding of decision making, of what justice is, of what honor is? What is really, what do we really mean when we talk about well, you know, I was just defending my honor. This is not a sentence that we actually say often, <laughs> but maybe it's in the back of our head sometimes. Um, how do these texts really have us think differently about these ideas? So let's summarize a little bit what we said so far before we discuss a little bit more the engagement with the text. We talked about how to enliven the text, provide a historical background, uh, uh, artifacts, bring text to class, read out loud. Critical thinking, so what I like to do is I throw a critical question out there like, well, you know, what about the two ideas of betrayal in the text? And the student, hmm, why don't you guys discuss it in groups? And then we open it up to the whole class. And then that usually leads up to some very engaging conversations altogether. And what about the engagement with the text? So, all right, so we have this ancient text. Can it help us understand something about our present days? How does it affect our understanding of what we thought justice was, or what we thought honor was? What sometimes I really like to do is to give students the possibility of adding some uh, extra credit 
to their final grade by uh, um, coming up with a project. We call it a creative project where they can use sort of like what they learned to either paint something or you know make a rap song or make a video about whatever they want. And some of these projects are really funny. And I want to show you guys if I can, I can't. I just, I don't know where to go. Oh no. Oh, there we go. Okay. I'm terrible with computers. <laughs> Awful. Um, let's look at this one. Some of our students made a video pretending that they were, um, that they were gods. Let's watch a little bit of it. What up, though? It's your boy DJ Snoopadella, and I know you're gonna dig this. Hey, great party! It looks like everybody here is having a great time. Thanks, girl. I'm a little worried though. I didn't invite Eris. Of course you didn't. She goes. She gets ways at all the before she goes here and ruins everybody's fun. Yeah, I know. She's really spiteful, though. With all these pictures on Instagram, she's bound to get jealous. Need it's its present time. <laughs> you better get back to the party, huh? Um, I've got it. I have a delivery for Tina Sopolius. Thanks. Wait, who are you? Nobody. Okay. Hey, Tina, you got another present. This is the last one then. Uh, would you like to do the honors? May I? It's a golden iPhone. What is it from? Um, it says it's not from Eris. That's sweet of her. Okay. To the fairest of them all. Who is that referring to? It's obviously mine, y'all. Everyone knows I'm the cutest one here. Good guy. Who is the most attractive in our high school year? But that's right, me. Um, not to interrupt or anything, but it's my party. So students kind of like uh, uh, expressing their own idea of what the judgment of Paris, you know, with the golden apple is, and kind of like having fun with the ancient text, which is really what we're getting at here. Kind of like how the ancient text engage with their lives today. Of course, thinking about big themes like you know justice and honor, but also just having fun with the text. These are beautiful texts of literature. That was it. I think we have w one minute for questions, so I don't know if any of you have. All right, that's perfect, because we only have one minute anyway. <laughs> Thank you guys for, for listening.